can you give people a, a brief intro of you, how you got to today, uh, where you've been, what you think you're going to do? <laughs> oh. Got a little bit of lag. But like any good COD studio. Um, sorry, my back. I think I was cutting out a little bit. Yes, yeah, sir. Can you start again? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I, uh, I got into crypto, I used to be a big gamer when I was growing up, and um, my friend and I were always scheming on how to like, have, like World of Warcraft and things, right, without having to go ask our parents, and um, it was eighth grade summer, my friend comes to me, he's like, hey, there's this new thing called Bitcoin, we just set up our computers at night, and then we can buy game time with it, so I'm like, all right, uh, we did that every night, we'd set up our laptops, we would mine um you know i kind of forgot about that bitcoin i think i spent some on like a club penguin membership for my sister and then you know forgot about what it was for the next five ish years um so fast forward to like college um you know i'm working at a venture capital firm and um, i'm starting to hear about crypto again and it's you know familiar enough so it piques my interest and i hear um and i hear that they invested in a couple crypto startups so my goal there was all right cool i'm into crypto i think it's kind of cool I'm going to scheme so that these people hire me. Um, and so I started learning about crypto in my free time, chilling at the desk, talking those guys up. And um, uh, I didn't end up working for them. I ended up doing my own little little startup, trying to do tickets as NFTs, um, but packed that up with COVID. And then, um, you know, left to do some tech consulting, um, was still kind of interested in crypto the whole time, you know, on Twitter, on whatever it is. Um, my friends and I started running an indexer for the graph just as like a little side project for fun. And then Got up the graph. You know, I saw Grayscale was hiring. I uh, reached out and, you know, here we are. So talk about uh, the, the VC. What, what year did you work for a VC company? Uh, 2017 to 2019. And that was kind of out of college, you said? Yeah. So I was, I was interning during college um, there. So um yeah it was cool got a lot of cool exposure got a lot of, got to meet a lot of people learned a lot of things um but yeah it was a cool experience thank you for mentioning club penguin because in my opinion that was peak internet um what? god what a time <laughs> um, sorry go for it ricker i was gonna say uh the beginning of my crypto stuff was also like not investment based i was like i was using bitcoin allegedly for like sports gambling I didn't have like an investment mindset. And so I was just doing like $20 bets of like 0.05 in like 2017. And then, you know, kind of the same thing where I kind of like didn't think about it for a few years until like yeah. 21, 20. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, a big reason I got into Bitcoin or I got back into Bitcoin was I was buying, can I say this? I was buying fake IDs and we had to send the money over as crypto. It was either crypto or Western Union. Western Union charged crazy fees. Bitcoin was like three bucks. And so what I did is I bought Bitcoin, I bought like two, three hundred dollars. By the time I sent the money, Bitcoin had gone up like 50 bucks. We're like, cool, I just made 50 bucks, whatever. This is interesting. Had a little bit of Bitcoin left and that's kind of, you know, what piqued my interest again too. So also, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of avenues to get into crypto. It's either, you know, virtual 2008 worlds of penguins sports gambling or alleged activity exactly what was the um uh, timeline after the well, did you were you into business going up to college i mean you kind of said you interned for a vc company um was that kind of like a new thing or were you kind of conditioned business through a kid in in uh -huh. high school and college or not that was kind of a new thing so i was studying biology i wanted to be a dentist um and you know like junior year i took I, I took organic chemistry once i took organic chemistry i was like listen guys i'm not sticking around for another eight years <laughs> it's just not happening so i uh i finished the degree but i just started taking like comp sci classes and um spent most of my time focusing on that taking startup um while working at the bc firm so um yeah i just studied biology don't know how i ended up here but, you know, it, it actually that's that's actually an interesting point, though, because because, you know, we're hiring we're, we're hiring right now for a research position and the whole industry is hiring for a ton of jobs, whether it's engineering related or not. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people trying to break into the space have, you know, some some fears or whatever, if not 
having the qualifications. And, and honestly, most people aren't qualified that try and come into crypto. It's, it's very rare to find someone, anyone with years of crypto experience. And let's be honest, most of the time that crypto experience isn't super legit, right? It's it's like, oh, I, I did something that this company did something related to crypto, right? It's kind of embellishment, which is, you know, typical in resumes. Um, but the point is that like, it, you got to look beyond that. Like, so, so it took me a little bit to realize that me spending four years learning biology was actually super helpful for a research job because as a biology student, you spend all day in lab creating data, running experiments, and then you get that data in an Excel sheet and you make charts and you have to pull insights from those charts. And then you got to write reports on those charts, which is basically what we do as researchers, right? I, I look at the data available to me. I look at the trends, what's going on. I, I have a couple ideas. I test those out with some of the data, chart it, see what, see what it looks like. And then, you know, I write some insights based on what I, what I picked up. So, um, you know, it's just one example from biology, but um, yeah, I just think, I think, I think really what it is, is just like interest in, in that sense, not to go too deep on the rabbit hole, I guess, but like for people trying to get into crypto, it's really just like, are you interested? Are you, do you have like that curiosity? Um, are you like involved on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever it is, right? Just showing that like it's 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 like actually like an interest or a passion, um, which I think was was helpful for me just just in most of the things that I tried to do. Yeah, I think finance is very uh, data science basically, um, and then you know coming from actually coming from like studying like nature and like biology and like organisms and thing, mm -hmm. I think is probably an edge for a lot of people who are like getting into like finance i think there's a lot of correlations between like nature cycles and and money stuff yeah um, it's but, it's a similar thought process like way of thinking yeah can you talk talk about research in general what do you what do you what's your like day-to-day -day at what are you researching what's your what's kind of your beat at grayscale anything and everything um you know my job at grayscale is probably one of the coolest out there i um you know, there's tons of knowledgeable people in the company. Like we have probably like the best lawyers and the best finance guys. Like, honestly, these guys are just so smart. Um, but like as, as the researcher at Grayscale, like I have the coolest job ever. I just get to research anything, and everything I want. And I get to be like that crypto resource expert. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, like my day to day, I'll wake up, I'll, I'll scroll through Twitter as, as everyone does. And read the newsletters that I get in the, in my inbox. And then, um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's just a mix of like poking around our data sources, looking at some charts, seeing what's going on in the markets. And then, um, you know, I guess trying to be creative with that. Um, so do you like teams come to you and be like, Hey, explain this to us. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do, I'll do like, like crypto teachings or just like chat and learns, uh, every week or so. Um, where people only come, we'll just like chit chat and talk about NFTs or um, Jack Dorsey and his his crusade against VCs and you know anything that kind of comes up. How would you explain uh, the metaverse to a beginner, someone that's just like doesn't get it? Um, ooh, that's a tough one. Yeah, so the metaverse is is basically just. It, it, the metaverse is like where digital experiences take place. I think that's kind of a phrase we've been using a lot as a, as a company. Um, and, and what that means is just, I'm, I'm a person in my daily life. I want to go do something, play video games, listen to music, something that involves a digital activity, like a digital medium, and I go use it, right? So, so to that point, we have a metaverse right now, like the metaverse exists. World of Warcraft is a metaverse in itself. Club Penguin was a metaverse. They just suck, right? So, so this, this whole like concept of metaverse today that we hear about, like, like the, you know, the popular term is, is, is more forward looking. It's, it's like the digital worlds or games or experiences that we have, but in the future, and, and it's meant to mimic things that we have right now. So like, if I show up to a meeting or I log into a game right now, those items, I, I don't own, I have no say over them really. Um, but maybe the idea is I log into my zoom meeting or I log into my game and now I own that like sword or that shirt that I'm wearing which makes it feel more realistic, right? Like I go to my meeting in, at, at Grayscale in person and I'm wearing my clothes. And if someone tries to steal my clothes, there's the government that enforces that. But in the digital world, that doesn't really exist. So I think the idea is just, you know, integrating that. So when I go to these digital experiences, I own the stuff. And now the government that's enforcing that I own the stuff is the blockchain, right? Um, so, you know, long way to go. Um, I guess it's kind of a longer answer too. Um, 
but that was good that was yeah that was <laughs> but yeah it's 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 just it's a weird concept um they've branded the internet as a thing as a product <laughs> it, yeah the, the internet that has been going on for a while the sans digital ownership has been yes the metaphor <laughs> but in the future you know ar xr vr cool stuff i can see in front of me without the classes yeah so i think uh what's his name sean curry was a pretty famous guy on twitter he had a great little thread that was like you know the metaverse is isn't really anything it's it's a time it's time period it's it's you know the the next 10 20 years when when you know these digital experiences become a little more authentic in in whatever way that 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 manifests itself right yeah true what are your thoughts on traditional finance in the future going into more DeFi? um i mean i think it'll become blended yeah. in the future i think the only reason right now it's not and it's so f separated is just regulation uh regulatory reasons um because there's a lot i mean there's a lot of great things that crypto has has drawn from traditional finance in terms of like market structures products businesses right like uniswap compound those are nothing new those are just rebuilt systems that we have centralized centrally um but then the flip can also be said so like a lot of these centralized companies can can learn from these DeFi platforms or actually just like like benefit from them i mean how many employees could coinbase i guess you cut and that sounds bad but like how much more efficient i guess could coinbase be if they had a lot of their protocols running like like look at ftx versus coinbase ftx has a i think like a hybrid on-chain infrastructure um that essentially allows them to have real-time data real-time settlement and, and provide data for free, right? And I think they have like four engineers in total. Swack. Like, and these dudes are, are just, I, I, I want to meet, I want like a documentary on these guys because they must Very... be the most insane engineers ever. Like they're, they're putting out so much, building so much, do, like creating so many good features so quickly. And it's, it's absurd with, with like such a small team. And I think the point is, is that, that leveraging some of these like open networks, um, you know, secure networks can actually help a lot. I mean, like look at banks, right? Like Bitcoin versus banks. The only reason banks have so many employees and there are so many regulatory bodies around them and it's so cumbersome is because it's just a CSV in their database that anyone, like I can go give myself a billion dollars if I wanted to at JP Morgan or at Jace, right? Um, and so you have to have all these regu regulations around it to protect that. But mm. You know, with crypto, with decentralized open networks, like you, you don't, you can be much more efficient, and so that leaves room for employees or people, you know, like the cut employees to go do something cool. Um, there's this, there's this book by um, Jeremy Rifkin. He's uh, like an economist. Um, he says that that human pr productivity peaked in 1997-ish, which is to say that like all these apps on the iPhones and whatever that come out for like productivity really, really don't help you much. Um, and and I think cryptos is a great way to like push us push us beyond that. I mean, you look at like Uniswap. Uniswap Labs is doing more volume than Coinbase sometimes. They have like what twenty employees. Um, you know, I think it's just the nature of nature and nature of how efficient these systems can be. So it's really exciting. Okay, I'm trying to understand this. So because Coinbase is kind of pretty centralized. That's why it has has to have so many employees for like security reasons. Yeah, I mean, all of their order books are are just a database, probably in AWS, which means, like, so so yeah, okay, so so it, the reason Coinbase can do like free trades, right, or, or or you know, offset ETH fees or not have to charge you ETH fees is because if I go buy ETH and sell ETH and swap it for Bitcoin or do whatever in the Coinbase app, none of that happens on chain. That just happens in their own database, which is free and you know it makes sense to do it that way. But it's their own ledger, um, and so because of that, they have to have not that not only do they have to have employees around that control systems, reporting audits, but then they have to have other companies and other regulatory agencies and everything checking on that, right? Whereas Uniswap is just a development company that builds a protocol, and then the protocol deploys on chain, and they're done with it. The, the protocol on chain processes the data, deals with it, with it, employee or users and everything. But ultimately, like Uniswap Labs isn't processing that data or holding it. They're just deploying the code that understands that data. Mm. Right. So the so, so Uniswap app doesn't feed data back to a to a database that the guys at Uniswap can just search, export, whatever. Right? That doesn't happen. Whereas at Coinbase, everything that we do 
dumps into an Excel sheet on their back end, more or less. Nice. So we are really seeing the efficiency of the compute of, of computer power kind of over yeah over it's like it's like trustless data and immutable data or immutability which makes the data trustless right which is a lot of big big buzzwords but you don't you don't have to have humans watching over things when you have yeah watching over things yeah it's like if we pulled money together right and then we just gave it all to john like like you and i are probably going to want to like be like yo like john like How's the, how's the money pile doing, right? And like, those are checks that we got to do as opposed to just having a system that we all trust that keeps track of every transaction we do, right? Which is Bitcoin. There was an analogy that I think Gavin Wood had about where Web3 went wrong or what it out, outdid itself for was where, you know, in the past you had little villages and humans had to uh, have checks and balances. If you make like uh, bad trades, then you get run out of town. So people are scared of, doing bad trades um and then you know you had institutions come in where they regulate those bad trades um and then you're supposed to trust those institutions and you kind of see that next wave of well institutions are a little bit inefficient as we go into the future and we can make things a lot more efficient if we build things with computer technology yeah exactly i mean then you then you like if you even look at who's working at these institutions whether it's like a government institution or like a big four audit company all the big any work done at a big four company especially like auditors is all done by like entry level 22 to 25 year olds right which are fresh out of college but they're the analysts doing the work and then on the flip side it's just normal people at like the sec right so so like these institutions you're supposed to trust them but also if you look it's just normal people yeah so a lot of people yeah. haven't seen i think that's where maybe vc areas or you know even financial areas of of work and like study once you kind of get behind the doors of what is supposed to be like, hey, these are big things that you don't understand and, and you don't have to because we got it. So everything is cool. It gives a little bit of peace for like the rest of society. And then when you kind of go behind and see like these are people just making things, even if it is a little tech based or hard, then you're like, hey, what's are you guys good? Can you guys do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, at least for like, I think for me, I had this impression that all of these you know, agencies and big name, whatever were like super strict had had reasons for everything that nah, you just kind of do it stuff to see if it works that's it which is which i think is why like you know decentralized protocols are great because you abstract all of the trust and ambiguity and you just write it in code like like the the simplest way i don't know if you guys know how to code but when i learned how to code for me it was like it was like eye-opening because it was like okay you you essentially tell like a, a three-year-old how to accomplish a task, like walk to the kitchen, open the cabinet, grab the, 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 the paper towels, grab the, the, the spray bottle spray, right? Like you have to say every single step, but once you say every single step, it's good. Like you just, you just press play and keep doing it. Um, when did you I start, think, when did you start getting into code? Um, college. I, I finished my like biology degree a little bit early. So I just finished all my, requirements with with coding classes there's only like two or three um but yeah um, um go for it what are you coding now what would you think uh, people if they didn't know how to code going in the future what, what, what should they learn i would just say python because it's it's pretty easy it's it's basically a calculator that understands words um and then it's fun like like for me i think what was super great was coming from like biology i, I would spend 12 hours a day studying organic chemistry and making molecules, right? Which then I go home and I'm like, all right, that sucked. Or I go spend like two hours, three hours in class learning how to code. And then I can go home and, and make like a little calculator or something that might make my life easier. So. Um, you got any pred uh, pred predictive things I can use for stocks or what? <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not. I wish. All right. I'm not much of a I'm not much of a gambler to be honest. I uh, well, that's that's where probabilities come in. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm not I'm not much of a trader lately. I um, you know, everything's just so exciting and new that I just kind of like buying stuff, holding it for a year or two, and just seeing what happens. That's At this point, seeing things go to zero is sometimes just as exciting as seeing things go up. So your, your chemistry in the brain still probably triggers something. Yeah. <laughs> you say something. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, yeah. there's an imbalance there for sure i was gonna ask your opinion on bitcoin and um 
what do you think the future of it is? I know that's kind of a broad question, but oh, I guess yeah. to, to narrow it down, like, do you think it's money? Do you think it's property? Do you think it's just always going to exist? Do you think it's going to lose popularity? What do you think? Oh man, this is going to, this is going to make some people mad. Probably. I got into it with some, with some maxis on Twitter a little bit ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think Bitcoin is a digital commodity and that's great. Um, we need that. I think it's solved and proved a lot of things for the industry. My view is that the first blockchain, even the second blockchain is not going to be the only blockchain that's ever used. Right. Um, it's kind of silly to think that. Yeah. And that was exactly what I said. Um, like the, and there's a lot of things that need a lot of different uses. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like, like Satoshi, right. He could be a God. He could also be a normal person. And my bet is that he was a normal person and he experimented based off of other people's previous experiments and his experiment was successful. Right. And we learned amazing things from that. We learned um, the importance of decentralization. We learned how to build trustless networks. We learned how to incentivize those networks. We learned, um, you know, we learned like, like, the different nuances of technical architecture. So, so to that point, I think Bitcoin is a digital commodity and I think that's great. And I think it's a great store of value. And I think, you know, like, like relating it to gold, it's, you know, people say like, what's the inherent value of Bitcoin versus gold? Well, it's, it's that it's digital, like 82% of digital of, of, of Americans are, are making digital payments, right? Like there's what, like 11 to 15% that don't even leave their house with a physical wallet anymore. Um, and the point to that is just the world's becoming increasingly digital, whether it's payments, activities, school, like, like, you know, and, and so we need digital stores of value. We need stores of value that are compatible with the internet and that, that mimic the similar properties as like physical items, which is ownership. So, so to that point, I think, you know, Bitcoin's a, a commodity. I think it's great. I think it will always probably be, you know, one or two in terms of the largest assets. Um, but then that said, I think, I think it has its limitations, right? Like the, the, the UTXO architecture makes it great for moving and tracking coins, but not necessarily like account balances. And so Ethereum was the next innovation off of that. It was cool. We've got this really great chain, decentralization, proof of work, whatever it is, worked really well, but it's missing, you know, um, some, um, capabilities here and here and here. Right. And so that's what they did. And now Ethereum, you know, proved decentralized network with smart contract architecture, let people build on top of that. But the cost of security and decentralization is expensive. So now we had Solana, Avalanche, Near, whatever, right? Phantom, and those all did super well um, because they iterated on that and said, okay, great. We've decentralization, incentivizing decentralization. We figured that out. That's a, that we, we know how to do that. We know it works. Let's focus on the speed and cost, right? So, you know, eventually Solana, Avalanche, and these guys will, will, will catch up on the decentralization. I just like to say that's a spectrum. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think, I think the ecosystem is going to keep developing. And, and whether it's a layer one, a layer two, whatever we call them, ultimately, I just call them application layers. Um, you know, we'll keep having more based on the use cases. And, and the other thing, too, is there's, what, seven, eight billion people on this earth? We can't have all that traffic on one chain. So it's, it's not only eight billion people; it's it, it's hundreds of millions of IoT devices and whatever it is, right? It's, uh, applications. So, um, you, you brought up VC Jack and Dreesen talking about uh, kind of decentralization and and VCs. Did you have a an opinion on what they were talking about? Yeah, who owns Web three? <laughs> Who's the real owner? <laughs> I mean, I, I tend to agree that it's not as decentralized as people want it to be. It's, it's just, absolutely. I think, I think here's my hot take. I think proof of stake is only in existence because people are sick of talking about the energy debate. Um, because let's be honest here, proof of stake fundamentally incentivizes or favors the wealthy in that system, right? The amount of asset or token you hold directly influences your ability to earn more. Um, and I think people understand that, people know it. I just think in large part, 
we're we're kind of glossing over that just because it makes it more investable for VCs or for yeah, or just for users who don't really understand too much. Um, so to that point, VCs do own a lot of Web3. I think I saw someone point out the nuance that like a lot of VCs are funded by pensions and universities and stuff, which is true. Granted, yeah, those those LPs don't have a voice in their investment exactly. direction. Yeah, but um, also the thing is though, it's just necessary. It's a necessary evil. Like we need money somewhere. Like like builders need to need to eat. Right. And, and the reality is that most of these guys, you know, can't just fund themselves for two, three years on a whim and spend all their money. And at least it's just, it's just tough to do so. So I think VCs are, VCs are great. I think right now, you know, VCs might've gone a little, little trigger happy with. There's also a lot of ammo to be trigger happy with right now that probably won't. That too. That too. There's just so much ammo right now that, that everyone's been getting millions and millions of dollars pretty easily. And, um, you know, it was great for the space. I think I think what we might see happen actually is in the next couple of years now, after all these projects have, have been overwhelmingly overwhelmingly funded by VCs, is we'll see new projects come and say, all right, we'll sell off 20%, 30%, 50% of our tokens, just like a set supply. And then to, to the VCs, acknowledging that they do need to fundraise, but then making sure to split the rest of that token supply very evenly or as evenly as they can. Um, I think, I I, however... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just say, however that manifests itself, I, I think we could see a shift of of teams focusing on, um, you know, VC funding or allocation of supply to VCs, um, foundation um, funds, the, the diversification of funds in the foundation, team distribution, right? Like not having the entire team in the U.S. or whatever. Um, I think we'll start seeing a lot of those metrics maybe becoming a factor in, in protocols soon. And that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of people tend to think in extremes of like this or that, where, you know, tops and bottoms of cycles, but you probably see a, you know, a midpoint somewhere of, of firms being like, okay, there's a lot of people wanting certain features and not wanting other features. They want us to do certain things and in the yeah. firms that will, will kind of, been to the will of of the market really uh yeah i think that's like that's that's what would be the differentiator between like the sushi swap and the uniswap right it's the same code base for the most part and same function um but you know maybe the qualitative aspects of those protocols are what people like long term you see that with banks too there's different yeah. they'd be like doing all the esg stuff but they're like all right every banks are banks but we do like one thing we plant trees when you buy gas so if you like that come to us yeah, absolutely. Um, two books you like and two websites you like. Ooh, books. Um, Top two books. Oh, damn, there's, that's <laughs> tough. There's, I got three. All right, here's two. The Sovereign Individual. Um, that one was recommended to me when I first started at Grayscale by, by the guy who hired me, Phil. Um, probably one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Yeah. Um, that book was great. Um, it was written in like the '90s, so very forward-looking, but almost spot on with this whole crypto revolution. Um, and then the other book I like is the Third Industrial Revolution, uh, one by Jeremy Rifkin. I think that one's really good. Kind of talks about how, um, how like you know the 1600s or whatever was industrialized by steam and and railroads and then we went to cars and coal and now we're at this this inflection point of you know moving on to the next one um you know solar renewables and um who knows right so i do think i've, I've seen end of work as well from him which is yeah yeah he's he's a super smart guy i really like his stuff there's a there's a shorter pod or like ted talk version of the book too on youtube somewhere but um Two websites you would suggest to someone to research crypto or, or modes of thought, really. Yeah. Um, websites to help that thought process. I'm trying to think of some that aren't paywalled. Um, paywall too. Paywall, I really like Delphi Digital. Delphi, Delphi is probably like top tier research in this space. Um, they're really good. Um, websites honestly i gotta plug the, the plain text capital website um 
Phil. That's his new fund. Their his their they their blog section really really good content like really good newsletters really good end of your commentary, especially for people that are kind of new in the space just like curious like what what do I what do I look into what trends what even happened, um, honestly probably one of the best newsletters out there. Sick, sir. Uh, appreciate your time. I really enjoyed it personally. Same. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. This was fun. Sorry for the delay. All good. You got a, a a parting sentence for for anybody listening? Um. Oh man, a lot of pressure. Um. <laughs> parting a parting sentence for your past self, perhaps. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um. You know, I would just say like, have fun, chase your curiosity, and don't take things too seriously. Sure. Um. You know, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not necessarily one of these people, but my friend said something really, really, really interesting to me one day. He was like, um, this was like related to investing. Um, he was like, you know, I've been broke before. I don't care if I'm broke again, I can get back here. Right. And I love that mentality. I'm, I'm a little too, little, little, little too risk averse to feel that way. But I, I love that because you got to take risks to go big and you got to, you got to take, you know, leap of faith and, um, I think that's just a great mentality to have in life, right? Like go big or go home and if you fail. That's okay. So wonderful. Matt Maxwell, where can they find you if you want to be found? Um, uh, Twitter, Matt Maximo one, pretty, pretty simple. I got a little penguin, penguin, I, uh, profile pic. So <laughs> that's me. Awesome. awesome, sir. Appreciate it again. Yeah. Thanks guys. It's good. It was good talking to you. Thank you. Thank See you. Have a good one. You too.